one of the hardest things about differential equations is that there are so many different types of differential equations and so many different methods to solve them. Now, I have an entire course here on YouTube on differential equations that goes into detail on many of the methods. But for this video, I wanted to kind of speed run through a bunch of different equations with an eye to try to decide how do you choose which method to apply to which equation. Now, one of the first things I do when I see an equation is try to decide what is the order, which means the highest derivative that appears. So the top one is first order because its highest derivative is y prime, and the bottom one is second order, its highest derivative is y double prime. Heuristically, the lower the order, the easier the differential equation, but it depends on more than just the order. Then I also really try to decide, is it linear or is it nonlinear? So by linear, what I mean is that the dependent variable y and its derivatives, that those all appear as part of a linear equation. They are those variables to the power of one, not e to the variable or one over the variable or any of the other nonsense that can appear in a nonlinear equation. And then there's allowed to be coefficients, and those coefficients can be functions but only of x. So in general, a linear equation that second order would be like y double prime plus some function of x times y prime plus a function of x times y is equal to the function of x. Again, heuristically, it's not always true, but heuristically, linear equations are easier than nonlinear equations. There's also an important special case of linear equations called constant coefficients. That's when those coefficient functions actually are just constants like numbers a, b, and c. And then the third thing I focus in on is, is what I sometimes call the inhomogeneity. This is the term with no y or y prime in it. But this can make a big difference. So for example, in the special case where it's zero, you have homogeneous equations. In general, homogeneous equations are easier than non-homogeneous equations. And indeed, when you study the R of X, there's lots of different cases, but you might have something like it being discontinuous. That's going to imply a different methodology. So throughout this video, we're going to analyze the order, we're going to analyze the linearity, and we're going to analyze the, the inhomogeneity if there is one. Let's do first order first and study a couple of the special cases. The first one is separable equations. This is a nonlinear equation. It's something like uh, x divided by y. It's something that you can split out where if I multiply both sides by y, I have all the y's on the one side and all of the x's on the other. This makes it really easy to integrate both sides and to get a solution. In this case, y squared over 2 equals x squared over 2 plus a constant. Separable equations are one of the few nonlinear ones that we can really solve, and so I always check for this first if it's first order. Now, I went through that example very quickly, but down in the description, I'm going to put links to full videos that carefully explain every single one of the methods that we're doing in this video. Okay, still within first order. Remember I said we could talk about it whether it's a linear equation or not. So this is a first order linear. And an example of that would be something like this. Y prime plus 4y is e to the negative x. And it turns out for first order, we can solve all of these. We can solve all of the linear first order differential equations. The method here, again, I'll, I'll show it very briefly and for a slower explanation, go down into the description. But the idea is we're going to come up with an integrating factor here. So it is always given e to the integral of, well, in this case I put 4, but in general it's whatever that p of x is. So e to the integral of 4 dx, e to the 4x in our case. Then the method multiplies the entire differential equation by this integrating factor. You put an e to the 4x everywhere. This is nice because you can rewrite the left-hand side as just being a derivative. I can evaluate what the right-hand side, just e to the 3x, and then the method is pretty simple from here. I integrate both sides, that gets me rid of the derivative, introduces a plus c, and then finally to get the y, I divide out by the e to the 4x, move it to the other side, I have my solution. So up to your ability to analytically solve those integrals, maybe sometimes you have to do them numerically, you can always use this methodology for first order linear equations. Those are the two biggest analytical methods that apply for first order. But sometimes you're given equations that don't look like that at all. For example, Bernoulli equations. This is something with y prime plus p of x, y is kind of looking linear. But then you get q of x, y to the n, that's nonlinear. It's a very special case, but it turns out if you just do a change of variables, v is y to the 1 minus n, it will convert this to linear. Similarly, you have homogeneous equations. These are ones where the derivative is written as just any function that you can imagine, but of y divided by x. You make the substitution v is y over x, it converts it to separable. 
So both of these are special cases depending on your professor. These examples may or may not be included in your differential equations course. Uh, the point is that they are things that don't initially look separable or linear, but after a conversion now do look separable or linear. Final thing I'll say about first order equations is autonomous ones. This is where y prime is just a function of y, there's no x dependency. And for the purpose of solving this equation, it's pretty simple, you just integrate. It means it's a separable, it's a really easy separable one, there's, there's no dependency on x at all. But autonomous equations are really nice because we have a lovely graphical approach. You can create something called a slope field here, where these little slopes at every point are just given by the derivative. This tells you your f prime. And since it only depends on y and not x, you get what well, these lovely little pictures and there's sort of a whole separate set of analysis that you can do about equilibrium points, whether they're stable, whether they're unstable. I'll link a video down below, but you should just be on the lookout for autonomous equations because there's sort of a, a separate set of questions that goes with them beyond just, can you solve it? Now we can upgrade to second order equation, yay. And the simplest of those are the constant coefficient ones. So I've got numbers like minus two and minus three, not functions of x, and that is homogeneous. So it's equal to zero on the right-hand side. There's no term here that doesn't depend on y. So you basically have to know this methodology because it's core so much. The basic trick is to guess y is e to the rt. If you plug this in, you get a bunch of e to the rt's everywhere. They all cancel. And this, in the second order case, gives you a quadratic. You can solve that quadratic and get a couple different roots. And the standard guess that you give is c1 e to the first root times t and c2 e to the second root times t. There's actually a few cases here. Like if I had started generically with three constants a, b, c in my differential equation, well, when I put in that guess of e to the rt, the roots are going to be given by the quadratic formula. And the quadratic formula has a couple different cases. One possibility is when the thing under the square root is positive, this gives you two real and different answers. That's what I just showed you. So I've got an answer like what I just showed. But it could also be the case that the thing under the square root is zero, in which case you get plus or minus zero. It's a repeated root. In that case, the guess is e to the rt, but then the second one is t e to the rt. And then the third possibility is that the thing under the square root is negative. That means your roots are complex. They're like an alpha plus or minus an i beta. In that case, the thing that you guess is a combination of exponentials and cosine and exponentials and sine. So again, I'll, I'll link details to this below, but just be on the lookout. Constant coefficients give these three different cases. In fact, the constant coefficient homogeneous case is used when it's non-homogeneous as well. So now instead of being equal to zero, I've got it equal to three e to the two t. And basically the methodology for the non-homogeneous case is to break it up into a few things. First, just imagine it was zero and solve the homogeneous. Do what we just did before. And what I mean by uh, a general solution is it's one that still has a constant. Remember there was a c1 e to the rt and a c2 e to the rt. These constants were unknown, but if I gave you initial conditions, then you go in and solve them. So solve the homogeneous solution with constants in general, then find any old solution that you like to the full equation with the inhomogeneity still present. We call this often the particular solution, y sub p, and then the third step is just add those two together. So step one, we've already seen. The question now is about step two, and then, and then we'll add the answers. And so there's a couple different methods here. It depends on what the inhomogeneity is. One of the standard methods is called undetermined coefficients. And for undetermined coefficients, what you do is you just guess a solution that is kind of of the same form as the inhomogeneity. So 3e e to the 2t, we're going to guess a e to the 2t, where a is an undetermined coefficient. So I'll, I'll put up very briefly uh, the work. You can pause and go through it if you like. If you guess something like this, you can then go through and figure out what the value of the constant is. And it depends on what's on the right-hand side. So there's kind of a little chart here that you can use if you like to know what kind of guess. If it's exponential, then you guess this. If it's sine, cosine, you guess that. So you can go, to go through the chart to know what kind of things you can guess. It's worth noting this doesn't work for all inhomogeneities. There's a second method called variation of parameters. I, I won't show that in this video, but I will put a link down in the description. And variation of parameters is, is often useful when you can't 
use undetermined coefficients because the, the non-homogeneity isn't one of these things that's on this list. One big class of things that's not on that undetermined coefficient list is when the r of x is weird. Like, for example, suppose this r of x here is discontinuous. Like, this is a function that goes up for a bunch, but then it drops back down to zero. Undetermined coefficients can't deal with any of these discontinuous functions. It also might be sort of discontinuous in a periodic way, like it keeps on repeating the same pattern over and over and over again. Or it can have even a weirder thing, which is it can have something called a delta function, which is a spike at one spot. You can kind of imagine like you, like you have a hammer hit that happens almost instantaneously, like a mass on a spring, and then you hit it with a hammer. You model that perhaps with a delta function, a spike at one spot. So for all of these kind of discontinuous and periodic and infinite spikes, there's an entirely different method called the Laplace transform that's really, really powerful in these cases. It's not that, actually, Laplace transform is really powerful in a lot of cases. It can solve a lot of the old ones as well, but I usually only go to the Laplace transform when I need to, when I've got these kind of examples showing up. And the big idea of the Laplace transform is if you start with the differential equation, you can transform it under this Laplace transform to be an algebraic equation. For example, like a rational function equaling to a constant, something algebraic. Then you can use algebra to solve it. In general, algebraic solutions are easier than solving differential equations in general. And then you take the inverse Laplace transform to get to a solution to your differential equation. Some differential equations courses cover Laplace transform, some do not. It's a bit of a big topic, so instead of doing an example, I'm going to put an entire playlist of examples down in the description. But, but hopefully you now see when is a good time to use the Laplace transform. And then the final method that's taught sort of in a, in a standard differential equations course applies to ones like this. So this is a linear equation, but because it's not constant coefficients, we can't use that old method that we were using for that. So a lot of the things in this category, second order but nonlinear, is the method of series solutions. And here what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's just imagine that our solution is a Taylor series, a sum of coefficient cn and then x to the power of n. I'll put up some slides here of me taking this guess and then working it out if you want to pause and read through it. And it, it should be said that series solutions are actually really, really powerful. Uh, at my university, we just study a little bit of them in our first course, and then they're, they play a really big role in our second course in differential equations. So this is just sort of the launching spot for these series solutions can be extremely powerful when you can't solve things other ways. I should be clear that in the sort of the high level overview I've done here, I've suppressed a lot of details. I haven't talked about the theory, I haven't talked about initial conditions, I haven't talked about all the sort of special cases and details that can go in a lot of these methods. However, I think I have touched on the major methods that are most commonly seen in differential equations course, and what I hope is that when you get to the final exam, you can look at an equation and now you can analyze well, which type of method ought to apply to which of these different equations. If you have any questions or thoughts, please leave them down in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll do some more math in the next video.